Okay, I'm very excited tonight. I'll tell you why. Because this is um, this has actually been what I've been waiting for since the moment we started this little adventure. So the gentleman that we're talking to tonight, believe it or not, is actually one of my heroes. So I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background on the background that I want to give, which is more important. I know he's a hero because you've been fanboying boying him for like six weeks. I've so been far. fanboying for six weeks. The thing about it is I actually first encountered this name um, way back in the early 2000s when Max Markson, who is a bit of a PR slash event master in Sydney, named Max Markson, and he bought across Bill Clinton. So I first came across Duco and in particular David Higgins back then because he sold out the event. And being what you need to understand, I, was ne- I, didn't, I didn't work in sport, whether it be Shane Cameron or the boxing events or the Warriors, that's not what you're working in. You're working in entertainment. And en- entertainment is a very broad field and the, and the king of entertainment is those that put their own money at risk to create events. And Duco Events is a, honestly a world-class organisation that took some significant risks. David Higgins and Duco created the biggest boxing event in this country, Civil War with David Tua and Shane Cameron. He's gone to new heights now because he's managing former world champion Joseph Parker. He's done things like the Nines over in Queensland. He bought the Rugby League Sevens New Zealand. He's got a hell of a portfolio and people don't understand what he does. I want to have a theory that I want to discuss with him tonight because although Joseph is a world champion, I believe that David Higgins is world-class in what he does. So I'd like to welcome David Higgins. Thank you, Mick. Dion, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> Look, first, before we get into the nitty-gritty, for me, this interview is a bit of a dichotomy because <laughs> I'm sitting here. It's the world's greatest men's grooming brand. Like genuine, authentic rock and roll, great products, and it's an entrepreneur who's kind of started from scratch trying to build it up. But at the same time, it's the smallest podcast interview <laughs> I've ever done. It's the world's <laughs> smallest media company. So here am I, the world's greatest men's grooming brand, doing the smallest interview I've ever done when I've got a cold just because I'm no Mick. Well, look, welcome. I'm sorry about that long diet monologue of a... I mean, you, honestly, no, Mick it's a is nice, like a... Um, no, one's, no, people don't say nice things. That's yeah. right. Thank you, well, Mick. Yeah. That's right. But it has been exciting, and he truly has been fanboying you for, oh, nah. like, no. Uh, 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 no, no, an no, eternity. No, 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 Dion, fanboying is if it's not fact. <laughs> fact <laughs> and fanboying. So you just insulted Mick <laughs> and me. Good on you, Dion. What's the next question? But, but no, no, before we go on a question, I, I just just want to bring this up. Let, let me explain why. So, I know why. No, no, let it's me explain because why. You, it's because you failed and you're looking at someone who's succeeded and so, like, you're just ne- like... I didn't expect you to get there so quickly. <laughs> However, when I'm in Shane Cameron, he won every regional belt outside of world title. So what David will tell you is there's a process. So whether you go one organisation or two, as you start to... Uh, promote and then pay money to secure the opportunity for your fighter to um, secure regional belts. Every regional belt gives you an increase in world ranking. Now, I have a theory, and I want to put this theory to David tonight. Joseph Parker is a world class boxer. He's won a world title. He's a world class athlete. There's no, and I can't commend him enough for what he's done. However, I believe that Joseph probably fought for a world title a little bit, little bit before his time and maybe we haven't seen the best of him yet because I think David Higgins was actually the, the best promoter that we've seen in on this part of the world and he, he actually created that opportunity before Joseph was ready. Well, part of what you said is right. So um, you're, the, the bit you're wrong about, it was too early, yeah. but you're right that we haven't seen the best of him. So I'll explain that. Um, <clears throat> Boxing is a risk-return business more than any other. If Dion, or Nash or I fail at our business, we'll take a financial loss. In boxing, and the reason it can sell pay-per-view unlike other sports is the stakes are high. So if it's a rugby game or whatever, if you lose this week, you can come back and win next week. If a player gets injured, they can bring in another player. Boxing, you've literally got a career that can live on die or one night where a win could catapult you to a $50 million payday and legendary status, and a lose could bury you at the bottom of the gulag, on the pyramid forgotten and judged. 
stakes are high, and that's why boxing sells pay per view and other events don't. Um, <clears throat> as back to my point, so the reason wasn't too early. It's a risk return business. Unlike our businesses, you could get knocked out, killed. You could get a brain aneurysm. You could get defrauded. You've toiled from your your dad from age three on the pads. Yeah. And every boxer, they want that fucking world title shot. Yeah. And only a fucking idiot would turn it down. Yeah. If you've toiled for 20 years and you get offered a world title shot with a seven-figure payday, yeah. if you turn it down, you might lose to some bum down in Hamilton yeah, right. for no money. Yeah. And so you don't have a choice, is my point. It's a risk-return business, and you've been working your whole life. When the opportunity comes, you take it, and your dream might just come true. And in Joseph's case, he did become world champion, yeah. and he defended it, and now he's earning his way back. Back to your second point, no, we haven't seen the best at yeah. all. Like, he's only young. Uh, they say a heavyweight reaches their prime at 32. Yeah. He's only 27, so... Um, and he's very motivated. So I think, honestly, I think we'll see him come back strongly. What, what does Ruiz feel like he won that fight or he, or he got ripped off? Because it was a very, very close fight. I was sitting ringside. Um, and I, I don't pretend to be an expert, but people I know on the experts on both sides say Joseph won just. Yeah. But Ruiz probably thinks if that fight was in Mexico, yeah, yeah, I would have right. won the fight. Yeah, that's right. That's so right. he's probably a bit outraged, yeah. Yeah. which in a way... It's good for Joseph because yeah. Ruiz wants to go rematch Joshua and then the first thing he wants to do is... Clean up yeah, the, clean exactly. up the, the so, messy business. That's right. And so in a way, Joseph's in the box seat. There's a bit of a trifecta going on between Anthony Joshua, Andy Ruiz and Joseph Parker in that the only man to take Joshua of a distance is Joseph Parker. The only man to beat Anthony Joshua is Andy Ruiz and the only man to beat Andy Ruiz is Joseph Parker. So there's this, yeah, that's right. So we should be on that undercard, hopefully. Uh, that's what we're discussing. Yeah. And um, and Joe learned to, learned to look, matured a huge deal in the last couple of years. So that's incredible insight. The, but the I just want to ask, so you're a boy from Hamilton, right? So you started no like, Oreki in Auckland. Oreki. So but but Duco started in Hamilton. Am I right? No. Right, what's the connection no. with Hamilton? Oh, the, the first event I ever did that got media interest was the fight of the century, David Tua versus Shane Cameron in October 3rd, 2009. But six years before that, I started from scratch. No one ever loaned me loaned me any money. Mm. I didn't have any rich mates to, to help, help me out. I, um, you know, I started from scratch and I was doing invisible business conferences, dinners, like wherever there's a opportunistic dollar to be made, the goal being to buy mum a house and rowdy rah. But the Tua Cameron fight, I was nearly going to give up. And um, I went to a movie, When Were Kings, at the Rialto. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated by how Don <laughs> King put together Ali Foreman. And that is, that's what inspired that event. And that got... Suddenly I go from never doing a media interview in my life to an explosion of media. At first it was disconcerting. Mm. But you'd get used to it quickly. And so Hamilton's kind of when we got into televised sport. In fact, it is. That was the first televised sport event we did. How did you come up with the funding for that? Um, cash flow. Oh, I really? pitched it to various sponsors and table buyers. And meanwhile, I had various old heads who should know what they're talking about. I won't name them. <laughs> publicly rubbishing it, saying, <laughs> That's right. this, your stuff, this guy's an idiot. He's going to go under. And here am I trying to get sponsors and sell tables You're right. while they... I'm being publicly trashed. Yeah, you're right. And oh, no, I, I came fine. close, but I had a hunch. It was the first ever pay-per-view event on New Zealand soil, yeah. like pioneered pay-per-view television. Yeah. And it's still it's still the world record per capita, yeah, or at least yeah, right. in this part of the world. Yeah, that's right. um, and in the end, I got fed up with being given no chance by people who'd never had the courtesy to contact you and say, mm. how are you going to do this? So I called them up, and it taught me a lesson that if you're being criticised, don't blacklist the people who are criticising you. Reach out and say, hey, did you think about asking me how I'm going to do this, which I did, and then I talked it through, and slowly I brought said people on side, but it was a, a yeah. learning. That's a really hard thing to do, to reach out to someone who's publicly criticised yes. you. Yes. It's really hard. Like you I've have been, to be philosophical. Been, uh, uh, you've been criticised publicly. Yep. I've yeah. been criticised yeah. publicly. And I hold a grudge, do you? No. 
they became friends. I, at first I was angry, being rubbish for weeks, and then I thought, fuck it. I, I rang up, I said, look, you've been rubbishing me publicly, causing me commercial problems without having the courtesy to ring me and ask how am I going to do this. Mm. And they said, all right, we'll listen to you. And both of them kind of became friends in the end. So you couldn't have, you couldn't have written a better script, right? And Shane Cameron, who's a lovely guy, but Shane was never a speaker. And a, a lot of the time, unfortunately, well, you know, hey, Kenny Rainsfield is Shane's best mate. And um, I love Ken. Can be a very challenging guy, as we, as we all know. How did you get Shane and David to go to war? Because it, that's what happened. <laughs> Goodness sake. All right. Um, I'm going to have to tiptoe through this carefully. So, so I've been running these business conferences and charity dinners with the goal of buying a house for my mum, and it was – there's only one revenue stream, ticket sales, so it wasn't making that much money. You know, about 2008, I was getting fed up, and I was almost thinking I should pull the pin or go get a job. And I went to When We Were Kings down at Rialto, and then there's this story of this used car salesman like called Don King that gets released from jail in Chicago or somewhere. And at the time, Ali, Muhammad Ali just been cleared to fight again, and, and everyone wanted to see Ali Foreman, but everyone had decided it was just impossible, the politics, the money, it's not going to happen. So King, who didn't really have any money, he goes to see Foreman, I think, at first, the management, and he guarantees him... Five million US, and it's it's, it's ten times yes, the most right. money he ever paid, and he doesn't have it, <laughs> and everyone knows it. So they look at him and they go, "Are you for real?" He goes, "I'll pay you half a million de deposit down, and if give me three months to get Ali and, and the, the event together, and if I fail, you can keep it's yours." So they were like, "Oh, he's an idiot. We'll keep his money." Then he went to Ali and repeated that process. So. He effectively made Ali Foreman, yeah. but he owed $10 million back, <laughs> back in 1973. So what does he do? He rings an African <coughs> dictator from Zaire and says, isn't it a disgrace these proud African men are fighting in America? You should underwrite. And I think the, so the story goes, Zaire or Congo, as it was known, effectively underwrites the fight. So... I'd been, I used to watch the sport news back then. I don't really watch TV anymore, as most smart people don't. But anyway, <laughs> so I've, so the sport news had Shane Cameron heckling and calling out David Tua, probably at the behest of Ken's, sorry, Ken, um, for years. There's a years of Tua Cameron build-up, and I'd never even promoted boxing. And it sort of occurred to me, I thought, this is like a microcosm of... The early woman, like everyone's calling for the fight, they think it's not going to happen. And Tua had kindly spoken on a business conference for us in Wellington. So, him and a contractor, and I used got to know Tua. And so, I thought, <clears throat> so then I started researching, and I'd seen, I had seen what the Cameron team had offered Tua, um, and it was a lot less, and they had Mark Hotch and Eric That's Watson right. behind them. And so I sort of look, saw the figure and the approach, and I felt the approach was less than polite. Yeah, that's right. And the numbers offered were, in my after thinking about all the revenue streams, because I went yeah. back to my point: a concert, then a televised sport like that. You've got pay per view TV, household pay per view, international television, food and beverage sponsorship, government money. You know, you've got ten revenue streams. So it started. And so I was like, I'll roll the dice. Like, no, I was at that point where, yeah, yeah. what the hell, well, yeah. I'll back myself. So I thought, I'll go to tour with a, a polite and, a, you know, respectful offer of... And to be fair, he he was great in, in that he always did what he promised. And, you know, I respect David Tour. And so we got that deal done. Then I thought the Cameron bit would be easy. I've never really told this before, so you get him what you want. <laughs> Um, I thought the Cameron would be easy because I was thinking they'd been calling out to her for years, right? Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. So um, th th there's a few months that go by of interesting discussions and then I end up in a boardroom of some rich lister who I won't name. And this is lawyers and mild <laughs> men and threats, shall we say, and... I, I, it was all a bit amusing, but in the end, we did get the deal and we had to pay the equal amount in the end. Yeah. And so, you know, good on them both, for Shane. 
he deserved every cent he got. Yeah. He'd been toiling for a very long time. That's right. And, you know, he, he took more punishment than he deserved because the referee was a hundred-year-old gentleman that was blind. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it was a disgrace. Yeah. And, like, I, I couldn't believe what I was dealing with because I'd never been... I've never had a fight in my <laughs> life. I thought... Oh, fuck. <laughs> anyway, luckily I was right. No, it, 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 it beat the news. It was the first paper in New Zealand soil, and it beat the previous record times four. So, wow. and the other thing people don't understand about pay per view, it comes in on the day. So, the day before, I'm going bankrupt and losing 1.5 million. Like, I'm fucked. Yeah. and praying, yeah. and then the buys are just coming in. and So everyone got paid, and I came out with my shirt, yeah. and it made a bit of history. But, but but Shane and David actually seemed like they hated each other before the fight. Yeah, that was a bit... Well, yeah, there was a bit of niggle there, yeah. and... Um, but now nah, they're very good now. But I but but I think you know, um, like it, when, when we because we we spoke to Shane Cameron about the fight, and I think Mick said a great thing. He said, you know, the the biggest wars are civil, the nastiest wars are civil wars. You yeah, know, the, yeah, the, the, yeah. When, we, when you're fighting, it's a schoolyard scrap. And and you know that was that was an internal New Zealand war, you know, and it was and it caught everyone's imagination, like you know, people who were watching and. You did really crystallise a moment, and and for so many, there were so many things to come from that. You know, Shane, Shane, I think got that. You know, he he had to overcome it eventually, and, and he's probably a better man for it. But it, we, all, we all, it also showed us the renaissance of David Tua, which we sort of forget. You yeah. know, that was his back. Yeah. That was him coming back from the from the grave. Yeah, he was know? formidable that night. There oh was no God. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, unbelievable. You know. Um, but what a yeah, but what a spectacle as well, you know. That must have given you a, an amazing sense of. I mean, what was the overwhelming sense at the end of that? That you did, that you know surreal, surreal. Like I'm not a chess thumper. The business of boxing is full of egomaniacs, macho men that enjoy violence, right? Mm. But not everyone is like that. Yeah. For me, it was it was a business opportunity. Um, more than anything else, and so it was. I'm glad that it panned out. Mm. Um, and I was sort of b- bemused, like, wow, you know, that was cool <laughs> that it worked out. Um, and it sort of it paved the way for what's followed. So the signing of Joseph Parker, the investment, um, it's sort of boxing was kind of a New Zealand sport. You would rugby there and cricket, netball, boxing there. And then it, it sort of boxing came back so yeah. to speak, by revenue, by viewership, by popularity, boxing gyms started filling up. And so it was... Yeah, that's that was right. 10, that was 10 but, years. but it's also... It's, 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 it's the people around it, right? Like, I think boxing is one of those things so... You know, it is easily brought down if if there's a you know a little bit of a lack of integrity, if you like, by the people running it or the or the fights that themselves. You know, then so often you see that you see mismatches or you see yeah, people yeah. just trying to get to a belt by yeah. fighting it's a called, bunch of no. They call it old school promoters will tell you boxing is a pyramid, and they'll say at the top of the pyramid there's a very few rarefied boxers. Mayweather, Pacquiao, promoters, managers, making a fortune, telephone numbers. But under that, and it's one of the sad things about boxing, is there's a whole lot of people being used who are going nowhere. They're never going to become world champion. They're underpaid, you know, punch too much in the head. So that side of it's um, hard to take, but it's it's the way it's structured. Yeah, but everyone's got a journey in boxing, right? Yeah. They do. You said at the start, you're this young kid and first big event, on the you know basically facing ruin, <clears throat> and suddenly you were thrown in the spotlight of the media. Yeah. So <clears throat> I want to talk to you about the media. Um, let's talk about the press conference in London. Yeah. How you portrayed internationally, especially here in New Zealand, and how do you feel about it? Again, bemused. Like you know, it's um. There's nothing like one one you have to be a realist. Yeah. Like there's nothing you can really do about it. <laughs> it's like the past. Yeah. And second, it's you know, if you're a bit misunderstood, whatever. Um in that case, I make for London I make no apologies. Yeah. Um I'd been i I'd made a, a handshake deal, spirit of the agreement that we'd have a neutral referee. Yeah. The contract stipulated neutral referee. The WBO rules officiating the world title stipulated neutral referee. Yeah. Um, um, so basically, the fact they picked 
the, the home guy that had, and it wasn't the Furies, it was the British Boxing Board of Control. This is for Huey Fury, right? That's correct. Yeah. British Boxing Board of Control picked the guy that had done Huey's last two fights and he wasn't that, it was average record. Yeah. And so I'm outraged. So what the public didn't see is that for a month I'm sending polite diplomat, diplomatic emails and lobbying then that's not working. Then I'm escalating it slightly. Then I, the w, president of WO, Paco Valcasel, sent a letter to the board. Then you Bob Arum. Then it escalates to legal letter. Yeah. And they, um, unlike boxing in New Zealand, the British Boxing Board of Control is powerful and has a lot of money behind yeah, them. That's right. In fact, the board of it is QC, lawyers, judges, yeah. whatever. So they don't care. <laughs> I don't know why that is. So anyway, so I went into that press conference... I was, to be honest, I was a bit gutted. Like, I, yeah. I'm doing everything I can to get a fair outcome yeah. for my guy, um, including the right contract, and I'm just being ignored. And so that press, the fight was in on Thursday in Manchester. The presser was in London on Tuesday. Tuesday morning, I wake up, and the fronts are both is calling my room, the, the former South African heavyweight. Yeah. But he's seen it all. He's fought like Mike Tyson. Yeah, that's right. Event that... Hollyfield, yeah, Vladimir Klitschko. And so I get the call. He says, Higgins, where are you? I said, I'm asleep. He goes, come down to the bar. So I roll down to the bar. <laughs> and he goes, he loves his tequila. He's like, Higgins, let's have a tequila. I said, oh, OK. So the press is at 11, at like the Dorchester or something. <laughs> so at nine, he goes, come on. So I go, yeah. So I had, yeah, I had a tequila, which... Anyway, so then How he says... One there. So then he says, what are you trying to achieve today? And I said, I have two problems. One, they won't change the ref to a neutral official breaching all the agreements. Yeah. And it's not the Furies' fault. I respect the Furies. It was other officials. Second, the fight's getting no media coverage. So Francois sits there quite considered because he's seen it all. Yeah. He says, we need to make a scene. <laughs> so, so we jump in the transport to the Dorchester and we're sitting there and he's sus he has orders another tequila. And then it's sort of starting at eleven and then my staff come along and they say, Guys, the, the press conference is kicking off. And I go, Okay, and then Francis goes, make them wait and then <laughs> orders another tequila. And then so and I, there was no pre there was no plan. But he, so eventually at about quarter past, we we go in, and I was just honest, and I'm sure Peter wouldn't mind me saying, because I really res have come to respect the Furies yeah. and the handshake guys. Yeah. So there's nothing to yeah. do with them and Tyson. And Ty what Tyson's done in athletic sports, amazing yeah. to be that out of shape and come back yeah, the way he right. has. Amazing. So no disrespect there. But I, I just sort of bowled up to the top table and said, hey, not a fair fight, it's not a mutual referee. And then Peter goes off, and then, and it was what was fascinating the way the media covered it. So the New Zealand media wrote me up as a crazy, mm. cra drunken maniac, yeah. you know, out the gate, yeah. mm. right? And if you re watch it, I got asked to leave and I slowly backed yeah, out, yeah, but I didn't back down. And interestingly, the British media wrote Peter up as a, you know, a maniac or whatever, yeah. the way he That's right. yeah. And so it was interesting the way the, you right. learned something about the media. And so instead of studying what actually went on or asking questions about what the agreements were, yeah. it was sort of a beat up of me here. And I'll tell you what, next day the ref changed yeah. and we were front page of the paper <laughs> all around the world. So yeah. those two things, when Francois said, what are your problems? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't change the ref media. It worked. Yeah. <laughs> it was a blunt force. Great method, outcome. But it worked. You know, it's a tough business now, media. Yeah. Like but, these, but these, I, these long it, form uh, podcasts are far more interesting nowadays. What you guys are doing here yeah. is we find okay. out the real story or but, take the time. But, but, you but, can't but, tell a good story in one minute. But They're also, like I think. That, but also, the media, I think, think we're stupid because, as a, you know, having someone who played sport, it was clear what you were doing. You know, like you, the, everything you just said in long form 
it did come through. It was like, yeah, you could have you could have maybe done it in a in a fashion that was a little cooler. But like, but like that's but that's but you but you got the job done, and it was and you could it see worked. the frustration. It was a genuine frustration. I, yeah. Ref was wrong. Yeah, sorry. You were being stitched that's up right. here. I'm fighting for my guy. Yep. And all of and you know we, what we didn't know is you want you obviously got press as well. But like. So, but that all came through, you know. Like I watched that. Well, and that's I was good. Like, but not I, everyone is like you've been. You've played international sports. You've had stuff written about you that's who, true. But who do you, and you've had stuff that is not true. And you've been around the block. So you're an educated consumer of media. Mo- a lot of people are not. Well, what gr- well what grinds me about the media is you get a, a journalist who becomes quite who who starts young and then sees a few generations of their sport or their or their topic. And they 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 never really they think that they know it all, but what and therefore they can judge and write and they have this perspective because they've done it for a long <laughs> time, and you know they but the truth of it is 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 that you know you they they haven't invested in it like that sports person or that person who's doing it has that person's invested thirty years probably or twenty yeah. years of their life to get to that point, and in a really deep manner you know and understands that sport or that discipline or that principle inside out but also times have changed mm. um w- you know when i first started media companies were turning over a billion and banking profit of 100 mm. million mm. and now they're being offered for sale for 30 million yeah, and making right. no profit that's and right. so they and without criticizing a culture can develop of in that sort of organization yeah. of negativity and cost cutting and clickbait you know you know where you 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 worry less about the truth of the story, but how many clicks it gets. And so yeah, it's crazy. times have changed a lot. Times have changed. So what? So what? So you're clearly a smart guy, but what's your skill? What is it? What is it that? So have you bought your mother a house? And what's your skill? It's a creative thing. So so my I don't care about money. It comes and goes. But to think of an idea in your head, like the Black Clash when the all back some black caps playing By the cricket. way, we're going to come back to because I've got a bone to pick with you. Okay, we'll come, we'll come back to that. Oh, did, you that get, did you not get picked? Oh, oh. In what world does the black caps play the all blacks in Without rugby and the, and the black caps win the rugby game? In what yeah, world but, does hey, that happen? I'm not, that's what he did. Hey, to be honest, way, let me retract. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even going to call them all blacks and black caps for re- legal reasons. <laughs> rugby <laughs> players and cricketers. <laughs> Top, <laughs> top, first grade rugby <laughs> players and cricket. Did you not? Do you not slick down? To be honest, I probably would have, or someone probably nah, reached out to you, said, well, and you probably, you probably threw a ball in that. No, no, someone would have said, "Are you interested?" And he would have like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> tell us, tell us, tell us. You I interrupted Rudy. But back to um, the question. So to think of an idea, whether it's p- trying to get to a boxing world title or putting that on or, you know, whatever and in your head and then to break down the steps. Like, how would you do that? Some people think it's impossible. Some people tell me that stuff's impossible. Mm. But, no, nah, step one, step two, just follow follow the steps and then you get halfway there and then people are buying in and they might just pull this off and then boom. So it, it's, like, it's a creative thing like a sculptor. Now, I don't want to sound pretentious, but I'm answering the question. So... I wish it was money. To be honest, you'd be surprised how much little money there is in this stuff. Um, it's not money, but it's it's a, a sort of a, it's a challenge and a creative thing. Um, yeah. Is I think what the motivation is. Are you an entrepreneur? How would you think of yourself as an entrepreneur? Probably. Yeah. Probably. I mean, I'm not on the rich list, but <laughs> I've done some harder things than some of the people on the rich list. Yeah. <laughs> so, so just coming back, bring it back to boxing for a minute. Joshua genuinely didn't seem to like Joseph towards the end. Well, that was, was my confer- fault. Yeah, yeah, and I was going to ask about that. What was your influence? Because Eddie Hearn seems to think you're the bee's knees. I'll tell you but this. But Joshua seemed to genuinely not like Joseph towards the end. Uh, some people don't like honesty. Yes. It disconcerts. And so the stuff I said, so what happened is my um, a friend of mine, so we, we, we won the Fury fight just. Yeah. And we're wondering what's next. And we're looking at Lucas Brown in Australia. And we're thinking, what next? And Joshua was the big one, the one that sells out Wembley. So I ring up Eddie and I said, Eddie, can we fight Joshua? And he said, to be honest, David, no. 
the time is not right. I said, why is that? He said, Joshua, um, one, Joseph doesn't have a big enough profile in the UK, and, and secondly, the fans aren't calling for the fight. So I was thinking about that, and I, I end up, my a friend of mine named Mike invited me to grandparents' stay at St Kentigan's College because granddad was not available. So I I turn up on time, I go to grandparents' stay, so I'm sitting in St Kentigan's College assembly with a bunch of elderly people and me. Yeah, because you're, nat- you're a natural tea. granddad. Some <laughs> such a- Scones and tea and so on. And me and the young lad end up in this assembly after hours and it, um, by then it was getting fucking boring. <laughs> like I preach, I'm privileged by the stage of that's why I went, but then it's like we're chatting away and they're like, shut up. And so I'm sitting there looking at the ceiling of the, of the assembly hall at St Kentigan's College and I'm thinking about the Joshua I thought, so Hearn reckons we don't have a profile and no one's going to fight. How would we fix that? So you just question yourself, I thought. And I'd been told by names I've mentioned earlier, that Joshua had been chinned and sparring numerous times. Now, I'm going to say who, but there were at least four prominent British trainers and heavyweights who said that he's going down regularly, but no one ever mentions it. It's like the Emperor's New Clothes. It's the worst-kept secret in British sport. Olympic gold medal, the media wouldn't dare say, oh, Joshua got knocked out. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, so I'm thinking... (laughs) How do I make Joseph famous in the UK and get ups- outraged the British fans to the point they demand the fight? Yeah. I said, we'll just, we'll just go into this whole glass jaw thing. <laughs> and so we sort of run this glass jaw thing saying he's mentally weak and he's chinny. Now, I'll come, I'll come back to those two points. Which Because so, all sportsmen oh, are outrage. being called oh, those two things. No, 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 no. And so there's utter outrage... The British are just going mental. It's, it, everyone thinks I'm a head case, you know, you know. And so, so anyway, eventually, they start calling for the fight, and so they say, "You're on the right track. Keep doing what you're doing." And so, slowly, it took over three months. The pendulum swings to the point that we're front runner, and we end up negotiating what is is the biggest single sporting contract in the history of New Zealand worldwide. So on one day for a one-off event, not a World Cup, a New Zealand performer is part of a $48 million joint venture. And it's the highest ever payday for a single performance by a New Zealander. So it broke a few records. Um, And then, but everyone still thinks I was just goading Joshua, calling him mentally weak and chinny. (laughs) Until Andy Ruiz proved me right. <laughs> but there was an interview, right? The Andy Ruiz Joshua. is solid, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joshua and Joseph, I can't think who the interview was. It was right in, close, intimate, where they just spoke to each other. And, and Joshua was saying to him, so you, so you think I'm going to knock you out? And Joseph's like, yeah, I'm going to. And it was just like this. And you could see Joshua was confused and yeah. angry. Right? Yeah. Joseph wasn't... Joseph's very, he's very easygoing and takes stuff in his stride. Like, he's yeah. not one to get, buy into that or get angry. Um, so, yeah, I, I, to be honest, I think Joshua wasn't used to yeah, right. that approach. Yeah. And that's, to be honest, if it wasn't looked, for that approach, he, he we, wouldn't have got the, we wouldn't have got the fight. But, but, but don't you think also it played into the way he fought the fight? Like, he really just yeah, stood off. He, didn't, he did not want to get into that fight. Yeah. So, on the record, Jeez. so who out of you two Muppets, who's the triumph and who's the disaster? No, or is it yet no, to be decided? Equal, equal parts of it. There's no, you haven't, you haven't worked it out yet? Well, no, I, the reason we're doing it is Mick carries... So Mick, f- uh, for better or worse, Mick invited me once to the Warriors box when I was a very sort of... Um, That's not true. What's the... He was part of the furniture. Loved a, f- loved a free drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said something to you, listen to this, I said last week... I was week, easily influenced back then. I said and, him and last he, week... And he used to wear these turtleneck... T- jumpers. Oh, like you oh, you think, fucking tell this story every week. It's not even funny, mate. Not, not, not you're one you're guest has laughed at it. Yeah, but he he's too young. He's not even. No, no, no. Let me tell you. No, 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 no. Listen to this. I said we rang last week. He's rang last week because he what he does after this. So next day he rings me. He goes, "Have you had a look at it?" I'm like, I'm like, yeah. He goes, "How did I look?" He goes, "Oh, geez, geez. I think it was good." I'm like, no, it's good. He said, no, no, I'm not just saying that I, 
I think I come across really well. I'm like, no. I said, no. I said, no, you do, mate, I do. But I said, listen, our roles are good. Because if you remember the 80s, there was this fantastic so movie. No, I'm the opposite. So, Mac. How'd I come across? I think I was shit. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was really bad. Oh, no, that wouldn't go. But I said, remember the 80s? Remember that movie Top Gun? Yeah. Well, that's how I dine. He's Maverick and I'm the goose. Yeah. That's how it works. He wasn't the goose. He was goose. Oh, it's the same fucking thing. It's not. It's quite we're split, different. We're split. It's anyway, quite different. next question. Well, I want to know about your relationship with Eddie because it bloody it went from it went from slightly abrasive and suddenly you guys look like you really like each other. Oh, Listen, it's business at the end of the day, but in business there are people that you'll trust yep. and do good business and there are people that you'll trust less. And so um, Eddie and I, like, he's he's a very busy man. Like, he's what he's doing is amazing. Like, he's got 30-something shows a year. He's travelling intercontinentally daily. Um, but you, how you know there's trust is the Joshua fight, Parker, became a revenue share deal and we were pushing for that and they didn't want it and I, I asked why and they they said to me that in revenue share problems often happen yeah. litigation because yeah, right. you have to you're doing and people they ask how how does a boxing promoter become a larger life personality yeah um, and I'm like well imagine Fonterra were buying a joint venture business in, in Beijing for 50 million bucks what would happen? is they do slow do due diligence for a year with a team That's of boys right. and accountants yeah. behind the scenes, then execute a transaction or not. Correct. In boxing promotion, you literally, uh, by virtue of the sanctioning bodies and the media, it's all public, yeah. you have to make a deal, like a $50 million deal, yeah. on only three months or less with someone you've never worked with yeah. in, on the other side of the world who you may or may not trust yeah. with the threat of non-payment, corruption, yeah. you name it. Yeah. And so a boxing contract at that level is actually probably an 80-page contract as complex as a Wall Street merger or acquisition. Yeah. People don't get that, and it's all played out publicly. And so to do that, and do you know what? And we've done two revenue share deals, with, and we've never had a dispute. So... You know, it's important to clarify, I'm not the promoter anymore. Yeah, that's right. I was the promoter. I'm now the manager. Um, but that, um, that is the reason there's real trust. Like, he doesn't need to rip me off. He doesn't need the money. For him, it's about legacy. He's trying to revolutionise the sport. He will. And and similarly, I don't really have any wish to rip anyone off either. And so there's a the teams have worked really well together and with real trust. And despite that money changing hands in an escrow account, I mean, we were vetted by MI6 under foreign money laundering law yeah. because we were a New Zealand business in yeah. a joint venture with a UK business. Um, there was not even a dispute, there was a cordial. And so, and there's a bit of humour and a bit of banter, which yeah. is important too. Yeah. So, what's the new structure? So, well, the... The, I came off contract in March, and, um, and I, so Joseph was without a promotion. But I'm his mate, and he said, would you help flush out the top promotional offers? See, so we pitched to be his promotion in October. It was turned down, but rightly so, in that you've got competing interests. You've got like ESPN and Bob Arum, two massive billion-dollar organisation, yeah. Eddie Hearn, and, so, and then you've got us in New Zealand. And so no skin off my nose. Um, so the decision was made to appoint a new promoter, and and a process was went through, and three different parties put formal offers on the table, and then Joseph and his management chose that option, and then they've hired me as an advisor or manager, part of the management nice. team. So the new structure is effectively, I'm now, I guess you call it management or part of the management team. So Joseph's promoter is now Eddie Hearn and Matchroom in the UK. So it means that when Joseph fights, the events are owned by Eddie Hearn and Matt Shroom, financially underwritten by Eddie Hearn and Matt Shroom, and they make all the arrangements. Yeah. They choose the venue, the date, the TV deals. And then my role is to help advise and negotiate money and stuff for Joseph. So how do you take him from where he is to get the best out of him? What's, the, what, what's, he, what's, what's required to put around Joseph Parker to... To, to maximise? Well, all I can do is give honest advice on the commercial areas that I'm good at and and I'm not. it's not for the faint-hearted. And so, 
you know, I've had to step up to situations that would be a bit, you know, worrying for some. And, and um, since day one, um, Joseph's read contracts and budgets because very difficult to do a deal with someone that doesn't know their business. And so mm. he'd be as good as most mid-commercial lawyers or accountants in New Zealand. He can scan a contract of 40 pages and spot a mistake. That's a good thing because, I mean, he knows the value of his business and yeah. then you know where a deal is. And so um, so that's my role. Um, in terms of him and his camps, that's up to him. It's not really my business. It's He's the boss. Joseph mm. Parker, T. Parker, the boss is Joseph Parker. Mm. Um, and, you know, some people might not understand that because they don't know him, but he he's a very, very astute young man, very yeah. smart, and he makes his decisions. Um, I think... The main thing for him is it's up to him. Mm. So it's not up to me or Kevin. I mean, we'll do our bit. That's a compliment to you, David. It well, really is. The, but the main thing, yeah. though, is that it really is, and he's really come, he's matured a lot in the last couple of years and he's taking training a lot more seriously, um, you know, and I think we saw it in that last fight that you, you come into your age and he's, you know, mm. now 20 seven, soon to be 28. Mm. Um, but he he would know better than anyone that when you're in that ring, it's on his shoulders. Yeah, that's right. Not me, not his parents, not, right. you know, it really is on him. And he's acutely aware of that. And that came through a number of years. Like, you know, years ago, and he won't mind me saying, he said it himself. He probably didn't take it as seriously. Um, that's not to say that there aren't other improvements th that can be made. Yeah. But... You know, I'm not really going to um, get into no, yeah, that yeah. stuff. Hang on, Dave, before we go. So we, we skipped, we, we went into something and we just, we sort of got ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to the Furies. When you're up in London and that whole media storm around that press conference that you invaded. But there was, there was more. There was, along the way, and correct me if I'm wrong, there was, um, there was some rumours, some undertow that you were threatened with violence. Oh, I was, but not not from very. So the day after I made the scene, yeah, I felt like a bit of a man alone, and yeah. it, and you know I'm not I'm not complaining or whinging. No, no, no. I made myself a man alone. So I'm sitting in a London hotel, and I've got really I'm getting crucified by New Zealand media. Yeah. Um, Joe and Kevin were really good. Yeah. Like Joe didn't know what to say. Should I apologise? Like he's a really good guy. Like he's yeah. loyal. Yeah. So he's the sort of guy that will have your back. Yeah. But they weren't sure what to say. They were thinking, what the hell? And then, you know, I've got my staff there. So I'm sitting in the room. And then I started getting death threats from random... I, I think the politically correct term is travelling people in yeah. Manchester. And so I'm getting... <laughs> well, you know, I've, you know, I have respect for everyone, but again, I'm starting to get random threats like... Can't wait till you get to Manchester, Higgins. We're going to slit your throat. Or we're going to shank you. You know, <laughs> the build-up of no, just random stuff on like Instagram or Twitter. No, that's no fun. Oh, I was starting to think, is this really worth it? <laughs> so I didn't know what to do. I did not know what to do, and I, I reverted to what you we discussed earlier. I rang Peter because. I always regarded the Furies as a handshake, yeah. honourable, honest men, yeah. like if you shake a hand. And so I did the opposite of what you expect, and I rang Peter up, and I'll be careful what I say, I don't want to offend anyone, but yeah. I, I said, look, um, how, how do you feel about yesterday's presser? Oh, there's a bit of silence, and he was like, mm, I've never been, sp I'll, I'll paraphrase, I've never been spoken <laughs> to like that. But no, do you know what? He was damn good about it. Yeah. Like really, no. I think he just wanted, honestly, a fair fight. And, and I, I felt that the whole way, way yeah. and that the way, that's the way it panned out. The whole thing about the referee was a sideshow. Yeah. Both camps just wanted a fair fight. Yeah. It's not anyone's fault they put the wrong ref in. Yeah. And so, to be fair, um, the, the, the Furies and Peter probably settled it down and saved the situation. I yeah, I yeah. That's so happened. that's... Yeah. And, yeah, so... And I'm very grateful for that, um, you know, and I explained I was just outraged and, you know... Yeah. And so it sort of, it, I won't lie, there was a bit of worry heading into yeah. Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, other, you other, other than six? whether your boxers were going to yes. do the job. No, or no, no. They're, they're good people and they're, you know, they've had, I've had a difficult life, as has everyone, but they, they were genuinely 
wanting a fair fight, and um, and there's a good cordial relationship between th- them and Parker and everyone. So there is no drama, yeah. like it all sorted out. Um, although, you know, at the behest of another team member, I did have to spend 10k on Chechen paramilitary <laughs> to guard the hotel. <laughs> Mate, from from the from the judges' decisions against Joshua, Joshua failed to look at David, look at you guys, recognise you guys, say a positive word, say a kind word. What are your thoughts on that? Did that happen, or was it my imagination? Um, no, because I can't lie. I don't want to be mean, no. but I can't lie. Probably the least um, friendly of anyone right. across 27. Right. Now, I'm not saying that's a criticism. It might be no. being rattled over the yeah. approach to the, the sure. to trying to gain the fight. But the fact is, the least sort of friendly. Now, yeah. it is what, no, but, you know, everyone has their race to run. And I think now things are cordial. Like, I think Joe and Joshua might have exchanged a text or whatever. Yeah. I'm not sure. It's not a question for me. Yeah, that's right. Cool, OK. What did you make of his post, Joshua's post-match sort of when he lost? What did you make of his immediate immediate sort of commentary? Oh, I'd say there were PR people involved. <laughs> no, for... look, no, I don't, no, look, he... I, felt, I don't have a view can I, can I, can I, I, Yeah, can I say what I think? It, it felt so manufactured, the whole thing. It felt like you've just lost a tight... It, it sort of almost... Presented as that's you know it, he wasn't really in the mindset to fight because well, if, if you're thinking that in such a peer if you can lose a big the titles all of those titles and then come out and say oh well this is not the, not the story and well, journey it felt just too prepared I've there was never no, no had, rawness to it at all I've never had a fight I've never competed for New Zealand like you have so I don't feel overly qualified to comment but I would suggest there were probably public relations professionals involved and mm. and that takes authenticity away. No, like, it does often. Like, it's... It, so I don't know. I mean, you're not the only one to say that. Yeah. Look, I just hope... I will say this about Joshua. He's been a commercial juggernaut for boxing. He he sold out Wembley twice and Principality twice. So nearly 100,000 at Wembley and Klitschko and then Povetkin, Principality, Joshua, Takam in the space of two years. So that's literally between three and 400,000 tickets. Yeah. What's that? Eight, six, seven times the size of Eden Park. Mm. One and two years, and it's Joshua driving. So every opponent that's been set up for life, Joshua's yeah. a part of that, and putting the sport back on the map. So I don't hate the guy. I, I, I barely met him. Mm. Okay, I don't think he's ever shaken my hand. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, um, what he's done for the sport commercially, winning Olympic gold... Yeah. I, does he have chinks in his armour? Definitely. Yeah. And that's I was guilty of pointing that out. Mm. You're a little bit of a controversial character in New Zealand, I, I reckon. Like, you know, people, you're a, people have an opinion of you, which is not always easy. And you know, uh, do, do, have you felt that? Have you felt that sort of presence? Mm, increasingly over time, I guess. Like I didn't, I certainly didn't seek it or wouldn't want it. But I guess when you're thrust in, <laughs> you know. In a crazy business, on t- t- you you will especially sport junkies like yeah. the non sport junkie wouldn't even know who you are. But yeah. when those diehard sport junkies will seem to have a polarizing opinion, it's either po- really positive or really negative. Yeah. And, but what's very interesting, um, most of them, if you spend half an hour chatting to them, it, it, if it's negative, it switches to positive. Yes. Ah, yeah. It's yeah. Funny. yeah. 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 It's not easy though, is it? Having like you know, knowing like having that re- reading negatively. Like I, I in sport, I, I've got a friend who's who is in Spandau Ballet, which is an old yeah, band. It's a band. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, be yeah, exactly and, what were you in Spandau Ballet? <laughs> of course he was. Look at him; he still dresses like he's yeah, in Spandau Ballet. Yeah. But, he, but he always like used to say like the difference between you and me is like you go to play you you know, he goes to play and a hundred percent of the people there are, are there to support him, whereas when in in sport only fifty percent if you're yeah, lucky fifty yeah. percent are there to support you. Good observation. And, and it's sort of like the the truth. So there's always the, you know there's you know there's always some someone who's going to have an instant dislike to you and I found that as a young man that quite hard to deal with but where it becomes really hard is once you start 
messing up in front of the media. You know, I got caught smoking pot in South Africa and then you, you know, then you abuse an umpire or whatever and all of a sudden it feels like you're the, 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 the you know, it public enemy number well, one. Warren Buffett calls it the difference between the inner scorecard and the outer scorecard. So I don't know if you've read Warren Buffett's book, but he'd be the, the Einstein or the Mozart of business in the world history. And so you've got Musa, you've got Mozart, whoever, Albert Einstein, Buffett, is a genius, and he talks about the inner scorecard being personal satisfaction, like regardless of what others think or say yeah, in yeah, gossip, yeah. Yeah. you know in your own heart whether you've tried to be good or whether you've harmed anyone or not, or whether you've done the best you can or been honest, and then you can take a sort of satisfaction from that. And then the outer is like trying to project success or you know, yeah, you know you what, yeah, yeah 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 and worrying about that and so I think that's the key to d dealing with those situations really is um, I guess <laughs> if you know if you've been good or not yeah. mm. and you know I personally don't think I've purposely set out to harm anyone ever and so I find it a bit amu confusing and bemusing I think it's a really interesting. I, I saw an interview with Matt Damon, so he's more, more the other genius of all time, Matt Damon. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> you're not right. Not at all. Not at all. Although he's a handsome man, so thank you for acknowledging that. Um, the uh, no, the um, the thing with Matt Damon was he just won. He at a really young age they did Good Will Hunting and they won yeah, yeah, the great Oscar. Movie. And they won an Oscar, right? And he he I had this article about him or an interview with him, and he just said. He sat there, got home after midnight, and had his Oscar on his lap, and he sat there and he just thought, thank God I didn't have to screw anyone over to get it. You know, like he'd got it really young and he and then hadn't, hadn't, hadn't had to screw anyone over. You know, there's a strong there's a strong view that they didn't write it. It was written by the studio for them. Really? Yeah. There is a 22-year-old... <laughs> Don't, my, don't no, burst my Matt Damon bubble. But, I mean, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck at 22 wrote an Oscar award winning... That's possible. Well, I'm just saying... There's a moon, there was a moon very, ending for That's you. right. <laughs> I know, I'm with you. I'm with you. So let me... Let me I want to I touch on a, on a subject that's a bit... It's not... Well, maybe it's sensitive. So let me just frame it up. I remember when, when I was with Shane Cameron and he was trained by Danny Codling. And, you know, you get to a stage, you're like, is this it, you know? And I wanted Shane to spar David to her. Um, who'd, who'd come back? That couldn't happen. And there was, um, oh, what's his name? The kickboxer that was with Dix McKay for um, yeah, Ray yeah, 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 yeah. And that they, you know, we couldn't get sparring. There was such such a personal thing. But also, finding trainers was hard. In Australia, they had a Hall of Famer named Johnny Lewis, who had Jeff yeah, yeah. I remember Johnny. Yeah. Yeah. So I brought Johnny Lewis over, and I said, "Listen, I want I want you to I'm going to put Shane into a camp here for a couple of weeks. I want you to." Tell me what you think. Have I invested my, you know, our money well? But trainers are very different, okay? Mm -hmm. And Johnny Lewis actually wasn't a great technical trainer. He was actually just a fitness trainer. So, you know, he got hold of a boxer and they were already very good and they told him what they wanted. Yeah. So, so Joseph's been criticised, critiqued. Everyone's got a bloody opinion about David to his former trainer who took him to a world title against Lennox Lewis, didn't win it, but they fought for it, and David's now with Kevin Barry. I've got to be careful because Joseph. I... Sorry, sorry, Joseph's now with Kevin Barry. I have to be careful this question because I know Kevin, respect Kevin and understand Kevin, and you're in business with Kevin effectively. But how's the pressure come at you and how do you work out what's the right decision for you and Joseph and how do you... What well, do you do? How, well, how does this mean? Well, it's quite simple. It's not my decision... It's Joseph Parker's decision. But but secondly, and what people miss, is that, like him or hate him, Kevin has done what's been asked of him, and to the point of control freakery. Now, yes. that's not an insult. No, no. It's, He's all it's, encompassing. Oh, yeah. So there's not a stone left unturned. Now, you you some trainer, Joe Bloggs, may or may not be the best trainer. Yeah. But how do you judge the quality of a trainer in an abstract environment. Um, he, Joseph did become the fourth ever, the fourth ever youngest world title winner in the history of the world, yeah. WBO world champion, yeah. age 24. I think that's the fourth youngest at lightning speed, and that's a combination of Joseph's talent, investment, heavy investment, Kevin obsession. Yeah. It happened. Yeah. Then it was defended three times. 
So it's easy to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Oh, and, yeah. and so for Joseph and I, we're constantly dealing with the speculation around it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it'll be, it's worked. What, what has been done has worked. Oh, and, yeah. and, you know, it's a, that all-encompassing environment is, has been part of what's happened. If, so, Mick, if Mick so, had have just been listening to you speak earlier, he would have like known that you've already answered all of that and said that who makes those decisions, so he wouldn't have needed to have that big dialogue. Well, it's, 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 but he did, he did get to talk about himself in the question, though, and so he was able to say that, mention that he's trained how do you put up with Shane Cameron. I told you, it's like so, Dean Lonigan. Yeah, yeah. Like, Dean, if you're out there, do your, do your national, you'll be good, get on well. But, but more, more, more importantly, what's, um, what's Manny Pacquiao's training? Uh, it was Freddie Roach. Freddie Roach. I'm not, I don't know if he still is. So, so you look back at, at Shane, and I wonder if he, because he never, you know, he never got outside New Zealand from a training perspective. For instance, oh, he was with Kevin in the embassy stages. This, these are just, we're just talking, yeah. Oh, you're going to ask the question again? Freddie, Freddie Roach is world class trainer. Um, Buddy McGurk. There's, there's a lot of lot of trainers out there. Buddy can't play golf for shit. <laughs> he, hacked, he hacked me around when he, before, before he allowed um, Shane Cameron to knock out Monty Barrett and one of the cleanest punches. Yeah. He hacked yeah. me around Gulf Harbour. And you know when you play, I'm, I'm shit at golf. Yeah. But, oh, my God, this guy was like, like a, it's like a three-year-old hack, hack. And I could tell you some, I'll tell you some stories off the air that you are hilarious I can't. I can't say this. Okay, it. But it's 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 always not going away, is it? It's 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 always got to be a, a thorn in your side or a presence. But, but you know what's fascinating? It goes back to how the stakes are high in boxing. Like people worry more about it. No other sport polarizes yeah. more than boxing. People are black and white. Like Tua Cameron divided the country, yeah. you know, in many ways. I um, mean, it's to do with the fact that there's a violent edge to it, and it's polarizing yeah. and. Um, and people with conspiracy theories, and, yeah. and and it just it's and and people that's why it sells pay per view. And, and, it's a crazy, and, and you know the highest grossing event in human history is by revenue. It, so Woodstock concerts b- b- by double the highest grossing event by revenue in the history of the world is Floyd Mayweather Jr. versus Manny Pacquiao yeah, on yeah. May 5, 2016, yeah. which double. is the worst money of at least. It turned over probably $1.3 billion. Oh. Number two of all time would be that joke, Mayweather versus McGregor. Yeah. Um, and then the, the highest grossing concert would be Desert Trip. It was three-day gig. Dylan, then the Stones. Day two was Neil Young, then uh, Paul McCartney. Day three was The Who, then um, Roger Waters. And Joseph and I went. We were front row next to Woody Harrelson in Paris. <laughs> it's, another, it's another story. But the highest grossing concert would have done probably two, three hundred million. So you had a boxing event, turn over 1.3 billion. The gate alone would have been 150 mil at, at, at an arena like Spark Arena. Yeah. Um, so we sat in the lower bowl. It's the worst money I ever spent. I went there to see Pacquiao knock me with her yeah. out. No, and the whole world. It born, I know. Set. And it was 20 grand to sit, not at the front, like lower bowl. Yeah. Front seats, I think you had to transfer 250k of cleared funds to the casino for gambling and you get a room thrown in. Yeah, I'm not right. joking. Yeah, that's right. The, the airport's full of private jets. So yeah. boxing drives revenue like no, no other event. And, why, but, why and you, you have you have no you have billionaires and mafia bosses sitting side by side. So if you think about crime around the world, now this is a theory of mine, organized crime. It's a cash business from Eastern Europe to South America to Russia, right? I would say nearly every organised criminal boss in the world was at that fight. <laughs> what are they going to? They, what are they going to do with their cash? So you've got Western. There's like Robert De Niro walks in, and then you've got the billionaire NFL club owners, and then these other people. And and yeah, so it's a it's a crazy sport that will bring out all. Walks of life. Yeah, yeah. Well, because what do you make of this sport? You know, you're not a. Bo- you've said you're not a boxer. You've been in a fight. Because for me, I I've been to a number of boxing matches, and I, you know, my father was a very good boxer. I've I've never been in a boxing match in my life, and mainly because he was a boxer and he would never let me do it. But the, but the, but for me, when I watch a boxing match, there's a point in the match as a sportsman where I can see 
one guy has has is has won the fight, you know. And so so often I see this: the guys, the other guys, in real trouble, and should this fight should be shot, stopped. And that's at the point that I lose interest in the fight because at that point I. I can see one guy's just getting hurt. But that's but I also feel that that's when a large majority of the crowd comes to life because they sort of want to see the guy get the no, I'm, I'm with you. I, don't, I, don't, I find it uncomfortable watching someone being beaten down or bullied. Um, you know, I'm not... I'm not... That aspect of the business, so to speak, one has to take in one's stride and be philosophical about because I've got staff to pay, bills to pay, tax to pay, people look to look mm. after... Um, and if I'm not going to promote it, someone else will. It's because boxing started probably before BC, mm. probably with the Greeks and Romans, and it, it hasn't shown, you know, and then it changed, and then you had the Marcus of Queensbury rules. It doesn't appear to be going anywhere. Where. Mm. And so I have to be quite philosophical, but do I take pleasure out of someone being overly damaged? No, absolutely mm. not. I mean, I think we saw it with the Tua Cameron fight. And that, that was a real eye-opener. Um, things are getting better, I think. So, uh, you know, you get the odd mistake. But, I mean, we we ran the first ever MRI testing of all boxes on the Flores event against Parker last December in Christchurch. It's a, an MRI, a proper MRI scan costs about three grand. Uh-huh. So the promoters, managers won't do it, or nor yeah, they could right. probably afford to. Yeah. So it cost us, you know tens of thousands, but we did pick up someone that had an aneurysm and was pulled off the fight. Yeah. Um, in the UK, you have to, under the law, you must MRI scan, and so New Zealand's a little bit behind on that front. Yeah. Um, that's and pretty, boxing's see, only... Does it, see, that, why isn't that... that that's well, boxing's that's only sport that doesn't get government funding, so if you're in any other sport, whether it's union or cricket or cycling, netball, you get sport New Zealand or government funding, and things like basic safety are part of that government funding. Mm. Boxing doesn't really get any proper support. It probably gets a few rats and mice. So was it ever was it ever public knowledge that it, that, that that happened that you did yeah. the MRIs? Yeah, and, it was and, in yeah. Fairfax, or uh, but we did, um, and we actually picked up someone that was then didn't fight. Um, but a bit of basic funding would help. Uh, don't worry about me, but other promoters, managers from Greymouth, yeah. to Whanganui. Yeah. That um, if there was a little bit of support, because people are still going to box. Some people, in fact, some people need it as an outlet. I've never been one of them, but there's some people that if it wasn't for boxing, they'll be in jail or dead. Oh, yeah, yeah, or violence. And so, and the, I've met people who I've seen as a ticking time bomb, what a, a violent, menacing person, whom has taken up boxing. And that's disappeared. It's a, it's, a, it's interesting. Well, it's like a transformation. Yeah. And suddenly, the same guy at the pub who would have knocked someone over a year ago, now will laugh it off and say, "Let's have a good night." I'm not, you know, and I'm not the only one to say that. Like, yeah. Better, smarter people than me on this area would acknowledge that. And it's not. It's called reality. Mm. You can be all socialism and theory, but the reality is, men in particular, not women. Men, I mean, I said if women ruled the world, the world would be a better place. Yeah, like, right. Look at all the violence in history, from dictators to murders to serial killers. They're all bloody men. Hitler, man, Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, bloke, you know, you name it. Well, the human, yeah, the human ego, isn't it? It's like that, that ability to, the power, power is, you know, it's that like great saying, power corrupts and absolute power, yeah. power corrupts absolutely, but it's, it is. It's the nature of the of the beast that that men in particular, the sort of apex predator, or the you know the speak for whatever. yourself deal. Yeah, that's right. He's speaking for himself. Hey, um, <laughs> mate, what's what's next for David Higgins? What's on the cards? I, I did hear a rumor about some something maybe in Vegas, and what's happening event wise? We, we've invested in a music event that's quite unique. It's orchestra melded with electronic dance music, and so. Um, it's, it's, it was started in Auckland. Yeah. It's only run in Auckland to date, but yeah. it had it was it was a very interesting model. People loved it, and it looked appeared quite scalable. So we're looking to expand it around New Zealand, which we are this year, <laughs> and then we're pitching it to other markets, in, okay. including probably Las Vegas. Yeah, nice. and so you don't want all your eggs in one basket. Um, you know, yeah. So we, I'm trying to. Keep slightly diversified. And sevens rugby league is gone from this country now. Is that right? Um, nines. 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 The 
The nines may start again, but if it does, I'd say it will be in Australia. Doesn't mean we wouldn't be involved, but yeah. I would say it was loved, it, it was well regarded by those involved, yeah. and so I think it could um, well take off again. Well, well, so this brings us nicely back to this cricket match. Oh, yes. That you, um, so. Do you know Dion played cricket? Yep, I used to watch. Um, 1999, I know Quicker, but yeah, he could oh. send the rocket down before his back kept oh, you, giving in. But that. there was deja vu watching the semi against India the other night, ex- nearly 20 years to yeah. the day, and it was New Zealand again at the same venue. 20 years, isn't it outrageous? It's it's like, gosh, man. I mean, I, it's an, I, I've just. I don't know when this will ever go to air, if ever. <laughs> but like the um, but 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 we've just suffered this horrendous sort of situation, and it's amazing that it's twenty years since that. I retired only three or four three years after that game that you're talking about, but it's amazing to watch now that that team play, and it, and you still feel connected. I I haven't felt as connected to a New Zealand cricket team as that group. But the heartbreak that they went through, you know, to build up four years of doing all of that, and you've experienced that with people like Joseph and building up for these big campaigns, um, and but dealing with that loss, I mean, what, you know, what, what what's your experience of, of dealing with the loss? I don't know. What's like, the, like, what's I'd just the, be next, scratching what's the thing my head. to do next? No, you sort of you'd be scratching your head saying what just happened. Mm. Um, it, I don't know. I have to again try and answer honestly. I'd, I almost bought a ticket to Lords at the last minute because I thought, I'm, I turned 40 this year. Will New Zealand play at Lords in the cricket final again in my lifetime? Probably not. No, yeah. So I was that close. And then it went down as one of the all-time nail bot dices in world sport. So I guess um, all you can do is <laughs> regroup and get back on the horse. There, there's nothing else you can do. You just yeah. carry on. I, I mean, I, 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 I mean, we did make two finals in a row. We didn't think that was possible. No, yeah. Yeah. I, the, the thing for me, it's a little bit like you, you know. The the thing is, we love the team. Everyone's you know thinks how they played, but in the end, in twenty years time, the the game will fade. We'll remember it was a great game and that we made the final twice. But in the end, we don't have our name on the trophy. No, I know, and that's a travesty. Especially what's come out about errors and the way it was governed. So that's what I was thinking that. We probably deserved our name on a tr- we we and we won't. We won't. We won't. And it's like and listen, the ICC, ICC should overturn it. Hey, Bloody ICC should listen to your bath. Oh, do you it's know not what fair. Jenny, the bathroom again, it's not or you want fair. To ask your it's not fair. <laughs> so, so, so the bottom, the bottom, the bottom line is. I want a couple more questions before we round this up. What's um, what's your relationship like with Jeff Horn now? Jeff. Yeah. Oh, cordial. I have no problem with Jeff. But yeah. no association anymore? Well, no, because um, when when we – I went through a, a business separation with a former business oh, partner, okay. and yeah. as part of that, I carried on with one side of the right. business and he with the other. Because that was a great talent coming through. Jeff, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The yeah, fact yeah. that you guys yeah. found him and he well, became a world champion. Well, Stuart Duncan found him, to be honest. Yeah. Our matchmaker yeah. out of Melbourne found Jeff. Yeah. And and I'd, I'd actually said to him, and I don't mind saying this again, it's true, for a couple of years I said – if we're going to sign another boxer, we want the best, someone that you think can be a world champion. Yeah. There's no point. If you're signing mediocrity, you're doing them a disservice too because yeah. mm. they end up punching the head, not make it, not make any money. And so Stuart Duncan was banging on about Horn for about two to three years. Really? And then, wow. So then in the end, we were like, all right. And so we negotiated a contract. Yeah. The rest is history. Yeah. And then he ended up beating Manny Pacquiao. It's so my final question, and then Dion can ask you what he thinks of you of him as a cricketer again. So the f- final one I've got: when you've got a local talent like someone like a, um, I think his name's Mosey Amatangi Junior. or something, a middleweight third. I know who you mean. Yep. Would you not look at a local talent? Is it is it too no, convoluted? No, it's, it's just no. It's 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 not so much that it's 
so I'll be with Joseph as long as he's with me. Right, okay. Like I'm loyal, and yeah. he's my friend, and he's always delivered what he's promised. And so we've a tight relationship. So there's no question there. It's do I wish? So the decision I'll have to make when Joseph retires is do I wish to be a boxing promoter mm. or not? And yeah. it, it might be that I decide, nah, I've had enough. Yeah, there's yeah, other yeah. stuff I can do, yeah. and other more creative stuff. Like once you've already done something, how many times What's do you want to do challenge? it again? Yeah. yeah. So it depends on what you're motivated by um, so that's how I'd answer that question Would you like to invest into a men's grooming company? No but I'd like them to invest in an event I'm doing <laughs> <laughs> well, You've come to the right place I mean I yeah I mean I I've, I just feel like um... No Dion he started as a lightning quick bowler for a sprat <laughs> Thank then you. after sustaining various back injuries his bowling slowly sort of bottomed out, and then he reinvented himself as an ugly but effective <laughs> bastard. <laughs> That's a very good synopsis. Well, yeah, well, it's, uh, no, and then by the end of it, he'd sc- score like a 50 and 100 here and there. So he was, uh, I enjoyed watching that bunch of players. Nice. Yes. Um, no, Any it's thoughts on that, Dan? An ugly but effective You'll love commentator that. You'll be now. fuming about the, the, um, after that fucking Higgins. No, I, no, I don't care at all. I, one of the things I think that you... <laughs> one of the things that you will never know because you never played sport to any level. But, um, <laughs> Neither did I. Or you. <laughs> no, I mean, no, it's always nice to have people who are old, who are old enough to remember. I, <clears throat> I get invited... Oh, four in England. I was... My, I was in Ireland in 94 or 5 and when Crow popped out a few centuries. That's right. And you yeah. got your 6 or 7. And I saw your name on the wall at Law, on the honours board at Lords. Is that correct? That is. Oh, so that there is. You you're his favourite yeah. fucking yeah. guest. And I was only oh, favourite guest yeah. of all time. I didn't do, I didn't do any the research wrong. either. That's yeah. a memory. <laughs> memory. Look at you. What's that gesticulation over there mean? Oh. Um, no. <laughs> The, um, no, well, look, I mean, I think I think we've come to a natural conclusion. Uh, when yes, we yes, let's to finish talk on about, high notes. Um, we're talking about, but, um, man, I've, been, I've, I've totally enjoyed hearing your stories. I mean, I, I've I've followed your career. I remember Juco way back and, I, and these two young punks coming into yeah, the yeah. scene and shaking it up. And I think I've always, apart from being an ugly but effective batsman, I've always thought of myself as a bit of a young punk. And so I, I admired what you did, and um, I was excited to that we were going to get to hear it firsthand. But I have to say, it's even more impressive, you know, hearing the detail, the thought, and 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 all of that what goes behind it, and um, and the courage, because actually, you know, yeah, in, in the yeah. end, brave, it's, it's brave a thing that doesn't man. get said. But um, you know, you've really set a bar, and and as a businessman, I asked you before if you're an entrepreneur, and. You know, I do look at people like you and what you're doing in my business as as people who you you know you 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 rate yourself against and are, and are inspired by. So, thanks for coming in. I appreciate it putting up with our banter. Um, Mick really has been a fanboy for six or seven weeks. Well, look, weeks. I appreciate you having me. I think that um, businesses like Triumph and Disaster trying to take on the world with quality um, deserve all our support. It's good for the economy. It's good for wages good for New Zealand, so I wish you all the very best. I hope you can do as well there as you did at Lord's back in 1994. <laughs> oh, and, and, um, and, um, if I said anyone, if I said anything that offended anyone, because <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean it personally, I just tried to be honest, but within the boundaries of respectability, so you did um, a great job. thank you for watching people. And I, I, I want to close by saying I'm, I'm, I'm still a fan of yours, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, 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 buddy. <laughs> I know that. Got you, David. <laughs> right, thank you. Wow.